Let's get it! Week 8 fantasy football coming at you. Welcome back to the channel. Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy Nicholas. We're diving into the usual. The key injuries, the must starts, the must sits, my breakdowns of my weekly recaps in my league, my locks of the century, all that good stuff. Yada, yada, yada. If you missed my Monday recap, go watch that. All that good stuff. Make sure you're going to follow me on Twitter. I'm like 19 followers away from 1,000. I need to hit that four digit mark. I need to put some respect on my name. Follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram, do all that kind of stuff. If you enjoy the video, please give it that thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're new. I'm not gonna waste any more of your time or any more of my time. I just wanna get right into the video. So let's get it. As always, if you are not subscribed to my newsletter on my website, go do that, bdgeat.com. Scroll down on the homepage, put your info in, and every Tuesday you'll get an email when my waiver wire and my running back backfield situation blog post comes out. So go done do that. Key injuries, numero uno. We're gonna start with the quarterbacks. That's Jay Cutler out in Fishville, down there in Miami, cracks up his ribs. Actually, a quick story here. That's the only bones I've ever broken. I cracked two ribs in high school, I was playing center field. Baseball, remember there's a shot between me and the left fielder. We're both running into the gap. I dive, I stretch out, I take a knee right to my ribs. That ass, I remember, like, it hurt at first, I stood up, and then I literally couldn't breathe, and I dropped down to my knee. I could not, no air was coming in or out of my mouth. I thought I was about to die. It was crazy, because I remember everyone watching me, like everyone in the infield, turned back around, and all of a sudden I dropped to my knees, and I was like, <clears throat> damn, my life flashed before my eyes. The only thing I saw was Chick-fil-A. It was crazy. Anyways. I recover. Jay Cutler will recover in supposedly two to three weeks. For now, Matt Moore takes over. Now, Jay Cutler left the game in the third quarter last week. Matt Moore came in for a quarter and a half, basically, threw 188 passing yards, two touchdowns. That 188 passing yards was 42 less yards than Jay Cutler has had in a game this year. So his season high is 230 yards, Jay Cutler. Matt Moore did that in about a quarter and a half. So. I don't think that anyone was worried about this because you can't really get much worse than Cutler. But for this offense, there's not going to be a lot of change in terms of production. What I do think will happen is who is going to get that production will change. And this is going to change the dynamic of this offense, but I'll get into that when I get into Devontae Parker's injury. Both of his touchdowns went to Kenny Stills, which is good to see. They are on a short week. So you have a new quarterback coming in on a short week. They're playing against Baltimore, who is a very, 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 very good pass defense. They've allowed the fourth fewest fantasy points to the quarterback. No quarterback has gone over 250 passing yards on them this year, and only one quarterback has thrown for multiple touchdowns. So Matt Moore is definitely not a recommended start this week. There are not a lot of receivers on this team that I would recommend start, not Kenny Stills, even though he scored the two touchdowns. They do get Oakland in week nine, so Matt Moore could be a streaming option depending on how he plays this week, so keep an eye on that. Next up, we got Carson Balmer. Paul Balmer. The bomb might as well be Carson Balmer at this point. He might be done for his career. He Actually, that's such a lie because they said he might be back in four to six weeks. I'm always more pessimistic when it comes to longer-term injuries. So he breaks his non-throwing arm. I would say he's out for the season in terms of fantasy purposes. This is a huge, huge, huge hit to this offense overall in terms of the weapons, in terms of the running game, just oh, like everything. It, look, remember back to, I think it was 2015? It might have been 2014 when Palmer was not their quarterback or he was hurt. And this offense was just, God, they were like the worst thing in the world. And you got to remember, like Fitzgerald was three or four years younger at this point. He was still pretty much in his prime and he struggled to find any kind of relevancy in fantasy. So Palmer out, Drew Stanton is going to take over. Now, they, you know, Drew, I'm expecting Drew Stanton to stu struggle. Uh, Blaine Gabbert is the guy behind Drew Stanton. So there, it's very possible we see both of these guys throughout the next month, month and a half before Palmer comes back, if he does. Drew Stanton's attempted 82 passes over the last three seasons. Six of them went for interceptions. Six of those 82 passes went for interception, interceptions. So that's over 7% of his passes going for interceptions. It's about one of every 14 passes. Safe to say you could probably stream any defense against them and have a respectable fantasy day out of them. What's more impactful is, is Fitz's value. What do you do with him? Look at these splits. This is Fitz with and without Palmer over the last few years. 
his numbers take a huge hit. Fitz is no longer a plug and play guy. I don't even know if you could really play him right now, to be honest with you. Maybe a lot of people probably don't have that luxury of just sitting Fitz straight up, but uh, I'm perfectly fine dropping anyone on this team. Any uh, receiver, John Brown, Jaron Brown, JJ Nelson. It's possible one of them has like a decent game this week, right? Like four for 80 or something like that, and maybe a lucky touchdown, but I can guarantee you there will be absolutely no consistency. So they're just gonna be wasting a bench spot unless you wanna roll the dice and start one of them. Fitz, you can hold on to, see how things work. He could be just the safety valve for these quarterbacks that are not gonna be very good, but it's it's a huge, huge hit. So if you can get rid of Fitz, I would absolutely try to do that. I've seen a lot of people getting trade offers for Fitz. And uh, as far as the running backs go, this is a big hit to AP because they're not gonna be moving the ball. Defenses are going to be able to stack the box against him. Um, he still should get like 12 to 15 carries a game. Still should see plenty of work. So he's definitely a hold. But uh, Ellington will be back, right? When Ellington's healthy, I think he's still going to... He's not like someone that is just completely off the radar now that AP had one big game, right? He's going to retain that third down role. He's going to be the pass catcher in that offense. And it's very likely that they rely on him or who Drew Stanton or Blaine Gabbert relies on the running back there for short passes, dump offs while he's getting pressured behind this shitty offensive line. So Ellington's definitely a hold in my opinion as well to see how this kind of works out. I mean, the efficiency and the production won't be the same as when Palmer were there, but Ellington should still be getting four to six catches a game going forward. So he's a keep in PPR leagues. We have uh, Leonard Fournette held out a week seven, surprisingly, like last minute kind of thing. As a, he's a bye week eight. All signs are are pointing to him returning in week nine at full health. Full, full health. He gonna be strong, like Arnold. Uh, Devontae Parker, I already touched on Cutler. So Parker missed another game in week seven with this ankle that was supposedly minor, right? Okay, so he's limited in Tuesday's practice. It is a short week, they're playing on Thursday Night Football, so he's definitely a game time decision at this point. We don't know if he's gonna go. Definitely wouldn't suggest starting him if he does play, he's gonna be Less than 100%. He's going against this really, really tough Baltimore pass defense. They have allowed the second fewest fantasy points to wide receivers on the year. And just look at his splits with and without more. And I think it makes sense because you just look at the type of player Moore is, right? He's not, he doesn't have that like chuck it, fuck it attitude like Jay Cutler does where he's okay throwing the ball up to Parker on these deep routes. Matt Moore is a more efficient kind of short passer trying to move the chains, trying to be, you know, trying not to lose the ball, turn the ball over, that kind of thing. So Parker's outlook takes a very, very big hit when it comes to this. And you look at Landry splits with and without more, right? They're actually better because he's going to be relying on these short, over the middle, um, easy dump offs to a guy like Landry. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, of course, because the last few years, like Parker has been in and out of the lineup. So all these games Landry's had might be without um, Parker in the lineup, but I'm just saying, it. It's definitely a boost up for Landry to me. It's definitely a downgrade to Devontae Parker. Overall, the offense should stay the same, if not probably an upgrade since Cutler's just been so bad this year. What I would say though is Baltimore's biggest fantasy games that they've allowed to wide receivers have come against slot receivers. There are guys like Alan Hearns, uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, Rashard Higgins. So Landry is someone I'm okay putting in my lineup in PPR leagues. Uh, especially if Devontae Parker's out. So Landry's a guy I'm okay with this week. Josh Norman comes back to practice for the Redskins, which is a big boost because they've been getting shelled by uh, by quarterbacks over the last couple weeks with Norman out. Dez goes to Washington. He's had a lot of tough matchups. He'll get a lot of Josh Norman in this one. So it's another tough matchup. But you look back to last year, he went 7 for 102 and then 5 for 72 against Washington in their two matchups. In 2016, so it's not like Dez can't produce against this team. So, you know, it's not like anyone has the luxury of sitting Dez anyways. Um, as far as, like, the Baltimore weapons, right? Like, all of them have been questionable and not being in the game. We have Ben Watson, Jeremy Macklin, Mike Wallace, all on the injury report. Ben Watson practiced. Roto World says he should probably be playing on Thursday night. Jeremy Macklin also practiced. Or wait, did he practice? I think he got unlimited practice. He either got a limited practice or didn't practice, but Roto World also says that they think he'll go on Thursday Night Football. Mike Wallace took a huge hit on Sunday, got a concussion. He actually had a limited practice on Tuesday, but Roto World does not think he will be playing. It, it does set him up to be a game time decision, but on the short week, it'd probably be best if they didn't play him. I'm not gonna speak to the injury, so, because we don't know, but I will say if Mike Wallace doesn't play, I think Jeremy Macklin is actually a very, very, Nice little sneaky play here as like a wide receiver three because he'll see a ton of targets. 
Ravens are looking. They need somebody back in their lineup like Macklin, and they're going against you know a Miami pass defense that's not very good. So Macklin could be a nice little plug and play if Mike Wallace misses time. Uh, Emmanuel Sanders, their uh, their head coach Vance Joseph said he has a chance to play in Week Eight. I feel like that might just be like coach speak, and it's probably not a real thing. But we'll have to see. It's a big divisional game uh, at Arrowhead against KC on Monday Night Football, so he gets an extra day rest. They've given up the second most fantasy points to wide receivers on the year. So people look, I feel like people look at KC and they just think of like Marcus Peters and they're like, nope, can't play fucking anybody against his passing defense. That's not the case. He's given up plenty of touchdowns this year and his passing defense as a whole is struggling. And it's probably a lot to do with the offense just putting up a ton of points and moving so efficiently that other teams are just chucking the ball and, you know, they're making plays on the other side of the ball. They've let six different receivers go over 85 receiving yards. And they've given up 13 touchdowns to wide receivers in just seven games. So they're actually getting killed by opponent receivers. And um, with, you know, Denver's offense struggling big time, they kind of need Sanders to return. If he doesn't return, uh, you, you look at the target kind of separation last week. A.J. Derby led the, lead, uh, led the team in targets with seven. Demarius Thomas, surprisingly, uh, only had six. He was second on the team. And then we had Benny Fowler. Third with five, and then Devonta Booker and Jamal Charles tied with four. So it's being spread around with Sanders out of the game. I would expect um, DT to get back up to double-digit targets if Sanders misses it. If not, I would kind of monitor reports. He's definitely going to be less than 100%, so I'm not like, excited to get him back in my lineup, but uh, he wouldn't be the worst play against this pass defense. Stefan Diggs. Minnesota plays in London. I hate playing guys in London. I don't know why. It's always like boom or bust. Like, it's either like 78 points scored in the game or, or 13. And it needs to be the Jacksonville Jaguars in order for it to be 78 points. Because it's like Blake Bortles. Maybe Blake Bortles was secretly born in London. No, he's probably, he was probably conceived there. I wonder if you ask Blake Bortles' mom where you think that has anything to do with it. I feel like that might play a role in it. What was I saying? Yeah, so they're playing in London against Cleveland. There's no updates on him yet this week. Let me actually check. I'll check Roto World for y'all right, right meow and see if we've got anything new on, on uh, Mr. Diggs. Mr. Diglett's been very disappointing, man. He, he's becoming like a real injury-prone pl player. Now it's, I think, if he misses this week, that would be at least three games missed in every season thus far. It, I mean, it wouldn't be surprising if, you know, because that's a long trip. It's probably uncomfortable to go all the way over there. Wouldn't be surprised if they sat him out for week eight because they have a week nine bye, and then he should be ready to roll week ten. So he's definitely someone I'm holding on to. Because when he's healthy, obviously he's a game changer, but the injury is concerning. If I mean, if you could sell him really high, like on the name value, then I'd say go for it because you don't really know. Like he is injury prone and it's annoying dealing with him, but otherwise I'd say he's, he's a definite hold. That kind of wraps up the injuries that we have. I'm going to get to the must start. So I'm going to say from now on, I'm not going to call these sections must starts and must sits. Because that's so dependent on your league size, like your your lineup and stuff like that. Like I'm not going to tell you that Andy Dalton's a must start when you have Drew Brees in your lineup, right? I'm just going to say these are guys that I like and these are guys that I don't like necessarily. So we'll start with the guys that I like. And that would first be, like I said, Andy Dalton going against Indianapolis. They have a home game. They get a home game against Indy. Indy's allowing the eighth most fantasy points to the quarterback position. They've allowed 295 passing yards to every quarterback this year not named Deshaun Kaiser. They're allowing the second most passing yards a game to quarterbacks, over 310 passing yards. Dalton's averaging over two passing touchdowns a game over their last four since Bill Lazor took over as their OC. That includes games at Pittsburgh versus Buffalo, so tough pass defenses. Dalton's really turned things around since the beginning of this year. Um, they're projected to score between like 26 and 27 points, so they are heavy favorites in this game. They're supposed to put up a lot of points. Dalton's pretty hot right now. Um, just a great overall matchup. You know, A.J. Green should eat. Now you have Tyler Croft, who's filling in as like a very good, um, not a playmaker, but someone that's shown that he can get it, get the job done for Dalton. And I think that's big for Dalton because Indy is a team that you could definitely create a mismatch when it comes to the tight end position. So with with Green out there, with Croft emerging as a, as a real legit like guy that he could throw to, I think Dalton takes advantage of this matchup. And I, I really like Dalton this week. And secondly, we have, again, Tyrod Taylor is probably just going to find himself on this list every single week because he's just, he's Ty God. God, honestly, he should just change his name. He should just, I would legally change my name if I were him to Ty God Taylor. It'd be epic. Like, I would love to hear what, like, 
that's Twitter is the most sensitive place on the on the planet. People would go nuts. People would like literally, I feel like, go to his house with like pitchforks and like burning shit. Like they like light knives on fire and like throw it out his window. We got we live in the most sensitive soft society of all time. Not that I've lived in another society, so I can't really speak on it, but I feel like we do. Anyways, Tyrod Taylor is just the king of proving people wrong, right? He gets another game at home versus this soft Oakland defense. Oakland just got shredded by Alex Smith. 342 passing yards, three touchdowns. They are the third worst passing defense in terms of yards per attempt. They are the only defense without an interception on the year. 10 to 0 touchdown and interception ratio on the year. They have the fourth fewest sacks among any defense. You take a look at Tyrod Taylor's home versus away splits. He's been really, really, really good at home. More passing yards, more rushing yards, just way more effective. And the Bills overall are very, very good at home. 3 0 at home. Got that rushing floor as always, so I really, really like Tyrod Taylor again this week. If I had to choose one between Dalton and Taylor, uh, I would probably go with Dalton. I think he's the safer play. I think he's almost a, a guaranteed multiple touchdown guy, 270 yards through the air. So Tyrod kind of gives you that boomer bust appeal, um, but I like both of them this week. Another guy I like is Alshon Jeffrey. You know, he's had his, his share of very tough matchups on the outside, and I know a lot of people probably expected him to break out last week with with um, with their game against Washington. And no, Josh Norman didn't happen. I haven't had Alshon Jeffrey on this list until this week. This is the first. I, I think this is the first time I've had him on this list. But you know, he's still being used, man. Carson Wentz is red hot. Um, Alshon Jeffrey has 16 targets over his last two games, so he's still getting the volume. And San Francisco has been killed by outside receivers this year, right? Look at Watkins, six for 106, two touchdowns. Robert Woods, 6 for 108. Jaron Brown, who plays the outside, he's a bigger receiver. 8 for 105. T.Y. Hilton, 7 for 177. They let up a touchdown to Josh Doxson. Uh, Dez went 7 for 63 and a touchdown last week. So I think Jeffrey, while Aguilar has been really, really, really good, and really surprising, he looks, he actually looks amazing this year. Uh, he runs his, his routes from the slot. Zach Ertz is, um, you know, over the middle, tight end kind of guy. Jeffrey is still the playmaker on the outside, and that's where... San Francisco kind of gets eaten up by their players. So Wentz is on fire. The Eagles are 12 and a half point favorites. They're expected to, they're projected to put up 30 points uh, as per Vegas. So just an all around good matchup for Jeffrey. And I, I think you should definitely, you know, he screwed you a lot this year, but I think this is not a week that you want to miss out on him in the lineup. Uh, and sticking with the Eagles, I love Wendell Smallwood this week. I feel like I'm in the minority here of guys who really like Wendell Smallwood, but San Francisco's been getting eaten alive by pass-catching backs. And uh, Smallwood is clearly, that's his role in this offense, along with 8 to 12 carries a week, too. So he's going to get the touches. He's going to get somewhere from 10 to 15 touches, and that includes the bulk of the passing work here. Uh, you know, Blunt should get plenty of work, but Smallwood is still much, much more of a factor than I think people realize. And uh, you look at the last few weeks for San Francisco, right? 72 yards and a touchdown to Zeke last week on that big screen. Um, they let up four for 105 to Thompson the week before, as well as three catches for 24 yards and a touchdown to Samaje Pirine in that same game. Uh, Andre Ellington went nine for 86 through the air against them. Gurley went five for 36 and a touchdown through the air. So they've been beaten plenty of times through the air, and I think that's definitely something that will happen. You look at Philly, right? They just lost Jason Peters, one of their premier offensive lineman, right? Their left tackle, which means there's probably going to be a lot more pressure on Carson Wentz. He's already, he's been sacked six times. So three times last week, three times the week before that over the last two games. So they're already getting a lot of pressure on Wentz, other like opposing teams. And with Peters out, I'd expect that to only rise more and, and you know, have more uh, backfield pressure. So that should lead to more dump offs and that should lead to a big game for Smallwood here. So I think he's a pretty safe PPR play. So he's, he's a guy I would suggest getting in your lineup if you are if you are in desperate need of a running back. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Let's move to some tight ends. I have a few here, just quickly. There's Kyle Rudolph in Minnesota. Cleveland is awful against tight ends, right? Letting the second most fantasy points to the position up this year. Diggs, well, I think a lot of this is factored into whether or not Diggs plays. If Diggs doesn't play, that means it's really only Thielen and Rudolph in the passing game, and they'll definitely look to exploit Rudolph, uh, Rudolph's matchup against 
Cleveland defense, which is very bad against tight ends. So Rudolph is someone that you definitely want in your lineup. Tyler Croft, I have talked about him already with Dalton. Another guy that I really like, he's in my waiver wire sheet. Um, I think Dalton is going to have a, a big game. So I think Tyler Croft also takes advantage of that weak Indianapolis passing defense. Uh, Croft has just been very good this year so far. He's filling in for Eifert well. And uh, I actually picked him up, and I'm going to be starting him in my E-Town Get Down League while uh, Delaney Walker's on a bye slash recovering from that ankle injury. Please recover. Uh, and lastly, Jason Witten. You're probably not sitting him at this point, but Washington, the, the Skins, are uh, letting up the third most fantasy points to the tight end position. I'm expecting a shootout in this game, and I'll go into that a little later in my locks of the century. Back-to-back -back big games for Witten. Eight for 61 two weeks ago. Last week, four for 54 and a touchdown. Prescott is really, really utilizing him in his offense while he's coming into his own zone. His 14 targets over the last two weeks. And uh, against Washington, there's only been one tight end, George Kittle, that didn't have a touchdown and or at least 90 receiving yards. So every tight end that's went against Washington, except for George Kittle, had at least 90 receiving yards or scored a touchdown. And, uh, and George Kittle went four for 46, so it's not like he had a bad game. So that's kind of like the floor for Witten, in my opinion. So I'd be happy getting any of those three tight ends into my lineups. And we'll move over to guys that I don't necessarily love. L-U-R-V. So off with T.Y. Hilton, right? He's just been super inconsistent. And, uh, you know, on paper, you might be like, oh, wow, this is a lot easier of a matchup this week than he had last week with the Jacksonville Jaguars, which is the case. But Cincinnati is not a team to be overlooked. They have a very, very good pass defense. They are allowing the sixth fewest fantasy points to wide receivers. They're the fourth best in the NFL in terms of yards per attempt. Only Seattle, Jacksonville, and Pittsburgh are better in that category. Third fewest pa passing yards per game allowed. They're only allowing 178 passing yards a game to uh, opponent passers. They've only let up seven passing touchdowns on the year through six games. And they are tied for the sixth fewest passing plays of 20 plus yards allowed, which is obviously an area of the field where T.Y. Hill and excels. So I don't see a lot of passing success coming from Indianapolis and Jacoby Brissett. I'm hesitant with Hilton. Uh, I would view him more as a mid to low wide receiver three for this week. Although the volume still might be there. I don't really want him in this, in this matchup. And then we have anyone on the Browns offense. Their QB situation is an absolute mess. They're going to be missing Joe Thomas for the first time in like 40 years. Their line just took a big downgrade. Uh, the Vikings are allowing 3.2 yards per carry to opposing runners. They are just one of three teams in the NFL that's allowed just a single rushing play of 20 yards. So they've only allowed one run of 20 yards on the entire year. And only three teams in the NFL have done that. They're 10 point, Minnesota is a 10 point favorite in a game that has an over under of 37 and a half, which means Cleveland is basically projected to score like 13 and a half points. So I don't want anyone on the Browns offense. I'm talking about any pass, pass receivers, Njoku, uh, Isaiah Crowell. I don't even want Duke Johnson in PPR leagues. I want nothing to do with that offense. Uh, next, a couple tight ends on the same team. OJ Howard and Cameron Bray. I don't think I would start either of them this week. Uh, I say this because, well, Bray's, the, the great bray has been great this year, right? He's been consistent. He's been a legit tight end one all year. Howard's coming off a really big game, right? Two touchdowns where he broke free. And a lot of people will probably be high on both of them because of the, uh, the games that they've had recently. Now, Carolina is not a friendly defense to tight ends. Besides Gronk, right? Gronk is the only... Gronk had 80 receiving yards. He is the only tight end on the entire season against Carolina that has had more than 30 receiving yards in a game. More than 30. Gronk's the only one on the entire year. This is a legit pass defense when it comes to tight ends. All right, you had... Ertz and Darren Fells, they had back-to-back -back games where they both had two touchdowns. So four touchdowns over two weeks. Besides that, those are the only touchdowns that they've allowed on the year. And neither of those guys had more than 24 receiving yards in that game, in either of those games. So if those touchdowns didn't happen, I know it's like a big thing to say, but that's it looks more fluky to me than anything. If those touchdowns didn't happen, this Carolina defense would easily be the number one defense against fantasy tight end. So I'm very skeptical to start Howard or Cameron Bray this, this week. And lastly, we have Deshaun Watson. He's someone I'm probably going to be starting this week. I know he's proven to be a huge fantasy asset on the year and he's looked incredible over the last few weeks. 
I'm still a little nervous with him traveling to Seattle, like him going into the, you know, they got the 12th man there. That's a really, really, really hard matchup for a rookie. What I will say is I think his experience in college, like the big games he's played in, right, national championships, the tough atmosphere, the tough crowds is going to help him, right? Like that experience is definitely going to help him in this game. But it's just a very, very hard matchup for them, the, the entire offense as a whole, right? Seattle's 2-0 at home. Um, they're letting up barely 13 points a game to their opponents at home. Only one QB has thrown for 300 yards this year on them, and only one QB has more than one touchdown pass against them. Um, what I will say also is they are susceptible to rushing quarterbacks, right? They've let up 20 rushing, at least 20 rushing yards to four of the six quarterbacks they've played. So I would say there's, there's pros and there's cons to watching going uh, to Seattle and playing them this week. But it's definitely a risky play for sure. And I'm not sure they're really going to uh, – I'm not sure you can count on him as like the, the high QB1 or the mid QB1 that he's been over the last few weeks. You look at Seattle, right? If you take away their week one game, which is a road game at Lambeau against Aaron Rodgers, they're allowing just eight, 180 passing yards a game to, to quarterback. So be wary of Watson. And then we can move over to my sell highs. I really only have one guy, and I don't even know if you're going to sell high. And it's someone I already covered. It's Larry Fitzgerald. I've gotten a ton of questions on Larry Fitzgerald. A lot of people have gotten offers to trade away Larry Fitzgerald. And I'm saying yes. If you could sell Larry Fitzgerald right now for 80 cents on the dollar, you might be even losing value. You're probably not even selling him high. I'm getting rid of Fitz, man. This this offense is not going to run with Drew Stanton at the helm. We've already seen it. We have a sample size with Stanton and Fitz. And that was when Fitz was three years younger in his prime. Sell Fitz now if you can. Buy low, Jarvis Landry. I talked about him before. The move from Cutler to Matt Moore for the next few weeks at least, right? He's out two to three weeks. If Matt Moore can play decent quarterback, like if he can put up respectable numbers, I don't see how they could possibly go back to Jay Cutler. If Matt Moore can throw up 250, <laughs> 300 passing yards per game over the next couple weeks, he'll stay. He'll, he will be the starting quarterback, regardless of Adam Gase's comments that Jay Cutler is going to stay the starting quarterback. Um, and again, right, Matt Moore is not one to take shots down the field. I was looking at his uh, on player profile. I went and looked at like his air yards, his deep passes, and he is <clears throat> ranked between like 30 and 40th among quarterbacks in terms of like air yards per game and deep passes per game. So he's not someone that takes shots down the field. And uh, that's a big boost to Landry. And there is one more guy I like, Hunter Henry. He's not someone you're going to be able to buy ridiculously low, but he is someone that I think is probably going to be tight end three or tight end four over the second half of the season. When you look at the snap counts, he has been playing way more than Antonio Gates has. It was only a matter of time before he really took over as like the the tight end in this offense. And, you know, it, it's it's coming now and it's it's happened over the last few weeks. You see Hunter Henry out snap Gates 47 to 18 last week. 54 to 37 the week before, 59 to 41 the week prior. So over the last three weeks, it's like 160 to to like 80. So he's almost doubled the snap counts. And um, you know, Hunter's just been going off. They're utilizing him in the red zone. They're utilizing him on on deep shots down the field. So if you could buy Henry right now, I honestly think he might match Travis Kelsey's production over the second half of the season. So buy, buy Henry now if you can, and he's going to be a top tight end rest of season. Leads us to my league recaps. This is not a good week for me, outside of one league. One league I dominated. So we have my E-Town Get Down League. I went into Monday Night Football up like 45 points. My opponent had Chris Thompson, Jake Elliott, Zach Ertz, and Terrell Pryor going. So he had four guys, and obviously Chris Thompson scored. Zach Ertz had a big game, scored. Jake Elliott hit like six field goals. I'm making that up. He probably had like two or three. But either way, I ended up losing. Um, so I am I'm three and four right now. And the fourth place guy, the playoff spot, is five and two. So I'm still two games back. There's plenty of season left, so I'm not front. I'm not. I ain't really tripping right now. I'm not really tripping right now. I just got offered Jay Ajayi for Des Bryant. I'm almost definitely going to turn that trade down, but that's that. My subscriber league took an L. Dude, this this was like the worst league I've ever, the, the worst week I think I've ever had. My team put up 14-team league, half-point PPR. We don't do kickers, so I put up 49 points because I had Carson Palmer who got me three because he got injured. 
Melvin Gordon got me five. George Kittle got me two. My Denver defense got me three. My highest scoring player was Alan Hearns of 12 and a half points. I scored 49 points last week. So um, I'm three and four, but I'm only a game behind. I'm three and four, but there's five people tied with me with that record. And then four people ahead of me, four and three. So I'm really a game out, I guess, of the playoff picture there. So I'm not, I'm not worried about that. In my college buddies league, uh, I put up another dominant week. I'm still three and four in that, but I have by far the most points in that league. Like, it's ridiculous. I have 850 points scored through seven weeks. That doesn't matter. You guys don't really care. I'm just blabbering on. Fantasy Jocks League, I uh, took an L there as well, I think. Actually, I don't even know. I hate, like, how I have all my leagues on Yahoo and then one on SleeperBot. Really pissed me off. I got to tell you. I tell you what. Yeah, I lost by 11, but uh, I still put up a pretty good amount of points for a 14-team league. I had Larry Fitz in that league, which is... That kind of hurts, but I still have, uh, but I also have Jordan Reed, who I could use in my flex spot now, now that he's looking like he's back to full health and back and ready to roll and, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to go right, skip right through my league recaps because it just wasn't a good week for me. And we'll move into my locks of the century. As always, three picks for y'all gambling folks. Last week we were one and two. I took Tennessee at Cleveland over 46 and a half. Not good. Baltimore plus five and a half. Not good. Jets at Miami, over 38 and a half. We took a dub there. So we are 9 and 11 on the season. As far as I'm concerned, if you're over 51% by the end of the season, that's a dub. I'm going to take my shirt off. for the, Not my shirt off, but my sweatshirt off. Getting serious. So. Oh, man. I'm excited to get the new tattoo right here. You guys are going to love it. Week 8. I have Seattle, minus 5 and a half versus Houston. Like I said, Seattle's very hot. 3-0 over the last three. Their defense is getting very, very good. They're allowing just, just over 11 points per game to their opponents over the last three games. 2-0 at home on the year. Like I said, Watson coming into the 12th man stadium. As a rookie, I don't think it adds up. Seattle's too hot right now. Minus 5.5. Let's take Seattle. We'll give them the points. Number two, Dallas at Washington. Over 55.5. Neither team is great on defense. Dallas hasn't scored less than 28 points since week two. Washington averaging 25 points per game over the last five games. If you look at their points total over the last three games, it averages out to 52 and a half for the Redskins. Um, look back at last year, the two games that these two teams faced off in, it was 50 points and 57 points, their total. So I'm expecting a shootout. I think they dominate this 50 and a half point total. I think they got up to like 55 to 58 points in this game. Let's take the over. And then Philly, we are giving 12 and a half points to San Francisco. So Philly minus 12 and a half. Philly is just looking very good. They're lo legit looking like probably a top two team in the NFC at this point. San Francisco, eh, not so much. Philly's at home, right? San Fran has to go cross country. The only way I see this not hitting, the only way I see Philly absolutely not dominating this game is if San Francisco hits like a backdoor and they cover, you know, like last 30 seconds, they score a touchdown in garbage time and, and lose by like 12 instead of 19 or something like that. So those are my locks of century. Seattle minus five and a half, Dallas, Washington over 50 and a half and Philly minus 12 and a half. Let's get it, locks of the century. I also do not recommend betting on my locks of the century. These are just games I like. Don't gamble, folks. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. <coughs> well, only the good ones. The ones that give you a lot of energy. <coughs> Talking about coffee. Grow up. So that's it. That's that's the quick recap video. Obviously, uh, the wide receiver cornerback matchup worksheet is going to come out tomorrow, as always. Probably between noon and 2 o'clock. Make sure you are subscribed to the newsletter on my website again. Because that's I'll email you guys out when that comes out. And uh, go follow me on Twitter, please. I'm trying to hit that 1K mark. Go follow me on Instagram, yada, 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 all that stuff. Give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. And I'll see you guys on the live stream on Sunday. Sorry about last Sunday. I mean, I was on the live stream. Oh, no, I lied. I mean, I was on the live stream, but I was at a bar. I was at brunch, so I was just drinking margaritas. I'm going to be in Austin this weekend for Halloween. So my flight back is at like 8 in the morning. I'm not going to be back till 3 p.m. Eastern time. So... I will not be on live stream this Sunday. I am sorry. Unless, oh, maybe I can get Wi-Fi on the plane. Dude, imagine I could live stream from on the plane. That would be sick. It ain't going to happen, but it'd be cool if it did. Um, so I'm sorry about that. So if you have any questions, make sure you ask me prior to Sunday. Actually, I probably won't even be able to answer your questions because I will be out all weekend while I'm in Texas. So I'm sorry if I don't answer your questions, guys. 
But anyways, have a great weekend. Good luck in week eight. And as always, I appreciate the support. And I love you guys. Peace.